Many people think when they hear the 80s, they think like, so, like, what was that? Today, thanks to the 80s, we're freer than ever to fashion our personal truth. I used to come to work in the morning, I made sure to pack my contact lens kit because no telling where I'd be flying off to. It was that there was so much money in local news that we were, we were rivaling the networks. Well, my whole life was the music. My whole life was WFNX. When WFNX ended, you couldn't pick me up off the floor. Like, I was devastated. Thanks again for joining us. We're gonna get started with our first speaker, Kathleen McDermott. Kathleen is a fashion history teacher at Mass Art. She's been a fashion history teacher there for 21 years. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen McDermott. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm gonna just jump right in. So um, in the United States, we used to have what was called the melting pot. Everyone was supposed to blend into the dominant wasp culture. And a big part of that was dressing just like everybody else. The melting pot cracked in the late 60s under the pressure of protests from African Americans, Native Americans, women, gays, anti-war activists, and hippies. And they used their clothing as very vivid symbols of their protest and the defiance of the establishment monoculture. By the 80s, as you can see here, people ex totally accepted that there, were, that there was no longer one elite culture and that the truth of each person deserved to be heard. Dressing to express your personal authenticity had become a given in American society. Paris fashion houses for hundreds of years dictating fashion had become irrelevant. And over and over in the 80s we see that fashion designers are fashion followers, showing luxurious versions of copycat, luxurious copycat versions of creative looks that are bubbling up from the street. Today, tonight, we're going to look at four powerful 80s fashion movements. We're gonna look at how they played out at the time and how they are still affecting our culture today. The first is hip hop. One of the best examples of fashion leading from the street. Now, hip hop, music, and fashion came to prominence in the 80s, drawn from the black urban experience in New York City and LA. Nothing like it had ever been seen before, mixing African roots, sports apparel, luxury goods like status sneakers, gold jewelry, and leather jackets. Paris designers quickly took notice, and as early as 1991, you see Chanel puts out a hip-hop couture collection. And that's very characteristic of 80s street fashion trickling up to the runway. But the really important cultural impact of hip-hop fashion is how it has changed the way the fashion system operates today. Kanye West today he operates at the highest levels of power in our culture. Here's a picture of his Yeezy fashion show at New York Fashion Week in 2016. He did this in collaboration with Adidas. The interest in this show was so enormous. It was streamed on social media and beamed out to theaters around the world. Hip hop stars, not fashion designers, are at the center of how fashion is done today, at the nexus of music, celebrity, big business, entertainment, and social media. Another important street designer that emerges in the 80s is Dapper Dan Day. In 1982, he opened in Harlem a store specializing in what he called knock-ups. 
taking rolls of leather printed with fake logos, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Hermes, and making clothes, hats, even car interiors. This had never been done before. Hip hop stars appreciated his taking symbols of wealth and privilege and making custom knockups just for them. Here is Olympic gold medalist Diane Dixon wearing a knockup of mink and Louis Vuitton monograms. Now, Dapper Dan was forced out of business within 10 years because of lawsuits by the luxury brands. Yet today, they realize they need him. In 2018, Gucci approached Dapper Dan and together created a new appointment-only boutique in Harlem where he is once again creating custom clothing, this time with Gucci supplying the raw materials. This leads us to our second 80s fashion, which is of preppies and the de deconstruction of privilege. In 1979, this poster begins to circulate around college campuses. It sounds like many of you recognize it. It identifies the arcana of preppy dress, the alligator shirt, deck shoes, initial rings, and khaki pants. The next year, the preppy handbook came out. It decoded all of the wasp clothing drawn from British upper class, prep schools, the Ivy League, and the country club set. At that exact moment, Ralph Lauren is mining the same vein, purveying aspirational images and clothing of English country life and 1920s Great Gatsby. All of a sudden, you can buy it yourself at the mall, no matter what your background. Now, over time, the preppy look will mutate into the vast clothing category that today we call American casual apparel, appropriate for men and women, work and weekends. It's how many people dress. People who say, I'm not into fashion, I'm just being casual and practical, like many of you in this room. <laughs> But it is a fashion, and the look went mainstream in the 80s. The third great influence is punk, paradoxically reviving glamour. When punk fashion emerged <laughs> on the streets of London in the 1970s, it was raw. It was meant to shock, repel, and offend you. It was safety pin piercings, chicken bone, jewelry, mohawks, and underwear as outerwear. The person most responsible for creating this street fashion was a punk herself, Vivian Westwood, who you see in this image. In the 1980s, she begins deep study in the historical costume collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And she begins to present a series of looks drawn from the past. On the right, her version of an 18th century corset worn as outerwear. Still punk in inspiration and impulse, but softer and feminine. This was new. No one had ever done this before. She adds the mini crini, a short outerwear version of an 18th century underskirt called a crinoline. Her research continues and she mines this history vein very deeply with a corset bodice painted with scenes from 18th century French paintings and in her Watteau collection, a punk inflected recreation of the 18th century corset bodice with a full-length crinoline skirt, 
all based on the idea of underwear as outerwear. Yeah, baby. <laughs> right. <laughs> and through a very strange alchemy, the mother of punk fashion has revived a historical era of extraordinary glamour. She mainstreamed it with her corset bodice dress with a full skirt, the wedding dress for Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City. And her corseting made visible is now standard vocabulary for red carpet gowns today. The final group affecting 80s fashion is gay culture making possible today's gender fluidity. Distinct looks of drag and gender experimentation were trickling up from clubs in New York City and San Francisco throughout the 70s and 80s and created a strong current of androgyny in 80s fashion. Here we see a man and a woman both in Armani suits. Note the inverted triangle body shape with broad shoulders, narrow waist, and slim hips. This is the classical Greek male body. It's a reflection of gay culture's strong body consciousness and in working out to build that body. The same inverted triangle shape was seen in suit jackets and dresses for women called power dressing. And women also began working out and doing aerobics to build a female strong body. Now, Armani suits are, were very expensive, another iconic garment of wealth and privilege. They're also, it's also another great example of the deconstruction of privilege. He took out the padding and the wool interlining of a typical tailored suit that made it stiff. And he used silk blended fabrics that would drape, hug, and show this new body type. So by the late 80s, nobody thought that it was unusual that both Elton John and Cher both used Bob Mackey as their costume designer. And this 80s gender fluidity has become one of the defining characteristics of our current time. In 2014, Facebook introduced 56 gender identities. In 2015, they opened it up and said, basically, you know, choose your own. <laughs> And so in a very short time, we went from two gender identities to three, to 58, to now the sky's the limit. Last year, retailer ASOS opened the world's first gender neutral store in Manhattan. Also last year, the Council of Fashion Designers in New York added unisex and non-binary to the categories of New York Fashion Week shows. And in March, the Gender Bender Fashion Exhibition, quite large one, is opening at the MFA. Many people think when they hear the 80s, they think like, so, like, what was that, right? But it's truly, truly remarkable that when we look back, when we, we see very clearly its role in creating today's world, where fashion leads from the street, where privilege is deconstructed, where historical glamour is revived, and gender is fluid. Today, thanks to the 80s, we're freer than ever to fashion our personal truth. Thank you. Kathleen McDermott, everybody. Kathleen McDermott, that's wonderful. Thank you. I got to say that, in hindsight, I'm a little embarrassed about the fashion that I was wearing in the 1980s. <laughs> and I'll, I'll leave it to you to guess which of those four categories I fell into. But in all fairness, for most of the 80s, I was not picking out my own clothes. So it wasn't on me. Um, How? It, it, You're not that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... 
this, this, thank you. This is fascinating. And I think when I think about how these different movements influenced clothing going forward, and, and culture, not and just culture. clothing, but culture, culture going forward. culture, yes. I'm wondering about this question of where does sort of a celebration of those cultures conflict? Where, where, where is it appropriation? You know, uh, is, is, is it a celebration or are there times where I can imagine like the hip hop people, like they're doing this thing for a long time and then suddenly the very same thing is being sold for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It, it, maybe some resentment of, of the, the, the influence that they've had. Is, is there tension there ever? I think there's definitely tension when people culture dip without giving acknowledgement. Yes. So it's about acknowledgement, I you think? I think so, yeah. But I guess there's the acknowledgement oftentimes, I can imagine come in dollar form, but they're, the people who really come up with these creative and brilliant ideas uh, oftentimes probably don't get the chance to sort of benefit so from them. So in the way, particular right? example I showed up uh, in the slides, I showed you the pictures of Dan, uh, Dapper Dan, yeah. and I showed the picture of the work that he did in 1989 for Olympian Diane Dixon. It was a, a very interesting mink and Louis Vuitton monogram um, coat. And that was appropriated by Gucci. They didn't ask his permission. They made a copy. The outcry was so enormous. It's that that pushed Gucci to then make an approach to Dapper Dan and to start collaborating and working with him. I think today we are very much better at giving credit where credit is due or calling out people when they steal ideas or culture dip. I wonder about when you were talking about Dapper Dan, like about what it is about him and about the people who influence these other styles that makes them such powerful influencers, right? Is there something more than just the style? Because I could have worn maybe some of these things and not had that same influence that the role that they play in the culture or, or that they ha there's something about the zeitgeist that people are listening to them at that moment? Like, is, or is it an individual thing? Is it something about somebody? Yeah, I think each of the, the groups I've mentioned have put together something new that had never been seen before, sometimes by taking from the past, sometimes by deconstructing elite symbols. And I think that's one of the emblematic things of our time is that we mix, we're like magpies, we take from all different places and create something new. It feels like when you talk about the four different categories there of culture, that at that time in our history, in the 1980s, we were pretty siloed in these, these four different areas. Um, and I'm wondering if that, do I have that right? Or was there more sort of uh, kind of going back and forth between the styles, and, and where are we now? Yeah, I think it is true that we did not know in the 80s how each of those four areas would actually become massive cultural forces um, as they've come together and come up against each other and, and kind of you know shaped our culture. I think you're right. I think they were kind of in their own little worlds, but that's changed. It has changed. You think? Oh yeah. I what's, mean, what's the situation now? Well, now hip hop is, is part of the whole, you know, world nexus of entertainment, music. As I said, all the whole kind of way that fashion is done, it's completely changed it. And gender fluid is one of the hugest issues of our day. Um, all of these were small things that we might not have identified as big in the '80s. It also seems to me that. It's not just a gradual line of influence that these things, these things sometimes tend to be cyclical, right? That, that uh, uh, the, the 80s will suddenly be back, right? And, and a lot of the styles that we saw back then are showing up. You know, gene height, I think about, you know, right? Uh, is, is, do you see that? I mean, what, what is it about that? Like when, when certain eras of fashion become suddenly fashionable again after having been, you know, uh, not for a while? I think it's the impulse behind the create the, the, the revival. So in Vivian Westwood's case, it's the combination of reviving an elegant, beautiful silhouette from the 18th century, but having a punk inspiration. So I think you can't just revive it without adding a little zest to it or a little point of view or 
some kind of something that twists it a little bit. Um, and I think that's what makes it interesting and that's what makes revivals more interesting than just saying, hey, I think I'm going to wear pants like people wore in the 80s or whatever. What, what should we be wearing right now? What's, what, what's fashion? Is there, is there a, a, a thing we should be looking to? <laughs> I think the beauty of it is we can all create our own personal truth in our clothing now. Absolutely. Kathleen McDermott, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Kathleen McDermott, everybody. Wonderful. Now, I'm very excited to bring up our next speaker, who is Bill Shields, who you probably all recognize and have seen on WBZ TV because he's been a general assignment reporter there for the last, I believe it was 39 years. Is that right, Bill? Join me in welcoming Bill Shields. Let's go up. You got a microphone there for you there? Have a seat. Uh, is there a reason I get a bar stool? <laughs> <laughs> I get one too. I gotta get my drink here. You imagine Kathleen must be horrified at me. <laughs> Guy's wearing a cheap suit. And, 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 and look at my boots. But you know They're what? New England, way. they are lived in. They keep my feet warm and dry, you know? <laughs> one thing I learned as a reporter is you gotta have like rubber soles if you have the leather ones. Oh, yeah, you yeah. wear oh, through yeah. them too quickly, right? No telling where these have been today, though. The whole shoe leather thing doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. No, 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 no. So, Bill, you've been, is it, is it 39 years now? <laughs> yeah. 39 years of BZ. So yeah. one decade of that was the 1980s. Yeah, I remember part of it. <laughs> the city was a lot of fun for a young single guy, you know? It was a lot of fun. But if you guys, some of you remember, back in the 80s, the uh, TV stations were big, radio was big, just the Globe and the Herald were here, there was no internet. So it was, it, it was a big benefit to someone who was a young reporter because, as I was telling Craig, I used to come to work in the morning. I made sure to pack my contact lens kit because no telling where I'd be flying off to. It was that there was so much money in local news that we were, we were rivaling the networks. We would go all around the world chasing stories. And uh, now we don't go outside of 128, but that's another story. <laughs> but it really was a heyday. But it was fun. For oh, it was. It was in, in my mind, it was the golden years, you know, for me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> now it's the golden years. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a lot of fun. We covered a lot of big stories. And uh, in my mind, we did a lot of stories that interested everybody. There was, a, there was something on the news every evening, local news, that would interest just about everyone, whether it be investigative reporting or some court case or something to do with economics or sports. It was, it was a lot of fun. In, in a way, though, I think as a, as a, a, a news reporter... <laughs> you have uh, a, a unique insight, and your your job is to be right there with the big stories of the day, every day. So you have, uh, I, I think, probably a, a, a different kind of memory of the 1980s than, than most people who just sort of were passive viewers, maybe, of the news. You were really kind of living it, in a way. To you, when you look back, first of all, at the 1980s as, as a decade, what do you think about? What what What... What comes back to you as someone who, who kind of really reported on it? It was very intriguing as a reporter. And sometimes adrenaline producing, uh, like when the mafia, the Angelo family was going down, the FBI took him down. We didn't learn later that the, one of the FBI agents was <laughs> in with Whitey. But we didn't know that at the time. Maybe yeah. Dick Lear from the Globe did, but I didn't know. At any rate, there were stories that got your adrenaline really pumping. Uh, and they were, and I think they interested the audience because the ratings were through the roof. And we were producing a lot of stories about the Angelo family. Yeah, tell us about like, I mean, what was what was Boston like in that in that decade with, with it, that? It, you know, it wasn't it, was, it wasn't scary. It wasn't scary at no. all. The North End was great, and it kind of uh, everyone knew who was everyone in the North End. I was in the North End once during the middle of the trial of the Angelos. And we were, they were on trial at federal court, and I took uh, a day to eat in the North End. We went to, for coffee afterwards, and a couple of guys came up to me and said, hey, Mr. Shields, when you're done with your coffee, would you mind leaving? <laughs> I said, I said uh, not at all. <laughs> and, and we walked <laughs> out, and, and my date says, what was that all about? I said, just keep walking. <laughs> but it was, there were some adrenaline stories. Uh, yeah. 
Sad ones too, the Challenger disaster, I covered that and they sent me to NASA a year later to do a follow up on the NASA program, the shuttle program. And I learned so much about the program. And the Challenger, I think maybe a lot of us sort of forget this, but that was a local news story. Yeah, Krista McAuliffe. From, yeah. She was from Framingham, right? She grew up in Framingham. We went to Framingham State College at the time. She lived in Concord when this happened. Concord, New Hampshire. She was a teacher. And you, you interviewed her, didn't you? Yeah, I interviewed the family uh, prior to the disaster. Yeah, and she was so nice and accommodating. You know, she yeah. was... That was a terrible tragedy. So where were you when, when the Challenger incident actually happened? I was in federal court on a case. And something else entirely. Doing something else, and uh, someone ran up to me and said, you hear about the Challenger? I said, no, what? And they told me I ran, found, found a TV in the federal security officer's kind of locker room. I found a TV and turned it on and sat in there until my... And then I forgot my two-way radio was off, and I turned it on. Shields, where are you? You know, my bosses were calling. I had to get out to Framingham. And so that's, and, and that's, I can imagine, one of the hardest parts of the job is in a moment like that to, to speak to the loved ones of, of someone who was lost. Right? Yeah, that was not a fun day. Obviously, as a reporter, you, those are stories you don't like because you have to go knock on doors that you don't want to knock on. But uh, it's got to be in the paper, you re what we call reaction. So you go talk to neighbors and friends. And I remember that day we went to Framingham State College and talked with her professors that taught her when she was younger. And it was, uh, and it, it was, yeah, it was not fun. Certainly you not. Know, and no. I felt a connection with her because I'd interview her and sat down at her kitchen table in Concord. Yeah. And I, she was such a nice lady. Right. I of just, course. you know. Um, for you, when you, uh, again, I mean, that was one of the big, when we look back at the 1980s, that one was one of the biggest news stories of, I think, the entire decade. Right. And, that, and, and, and right another there. one to me that was, again, sad. It was so sad to me, the Pan Am 103 crash in Lockerbie, yeah. because so many young people were coming back home here from England. They were studying abroad, and it was like three days before Christmas. And I was going into their homes and talked to their families, and... I mean, I still remember it like it was yesterday. Their stockings were hanging there and their presents. I'm like, you're kidding me. It, it, it ruptured my heart, you know? But in fact, I was pulled off that story after about the third day. My, my editor said, you need a break. And I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you need a drink. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the more fun things I think you said that you've done uh, was covering a uh, presidential election in the 80s. <laughs> it was 86, right? Is it? Uh, 88. 88, when, right. When Dukakis got the nomination and was yeah. running a... In the presidential, we, uh, we Andy Hiller and I tag team Dukakis following him around the country. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad I was young then. I wouldn't want to try it now. But, I mean, you'd literally wake up in some hotel and in the morning and go, okay, where am I? Literally. Because you were just going from place to place. I remember once in Texas, we were in like five cities in one day, just the airplane. And we called Dukakis his airplane the presidential pig, because it, when you rode on that, it was an old Boeing 727 that we were afraid would not make it. And so every time the plane took off, all the reporters, everyone's going, up pig, up pig. And, uh, but I remember that day in Texas, because we were worried about the airplane. It was like five cities in one day. Uh, and, but it was fun. I mean, I was young, and I was into the minutia of the politics, and following every word that the candidate said, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And you had a local guy who was running for president. It was, again, a, a national right. news, but a local story, and you were right at the, at the front of it. What, 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 were your, what were your impressions of Michael Dukakis I thought as a he, person? I, I, I just candidate? thought, as a person, I think he's one of the nicest, good-hearted people I've ever known. Yeah. Uh, as a candidate, he was doing well to the whole tank thing. <laughs> if you Does everybody remember the those tank of you thing? All, if you remember the tank thing. He was doing well until he posed as a picture in, in a tank with a little helmet on and he had like Mickey Mouse ears and it's just his head was appearing above the tank and it was like, oh. And I, I didn't think it would hurt him, but oh, it, it really did. <laughs> I, what, what was it like seeing sort of that trajectory after that from behind the scenes? And I can only imagine. I couldn't explain it. I, I, I thought this can't be happening. Kind of like, no, I won't say it. <laughs> 
My wife, tell me later. No, I'll tell you later. I, I couldn't explain it, why one particular photograph, and the media kept saying, this is why, and all the pundits and the, the research kept saying, this is why, that picture. I said, it can't be one picture. Look at what he stands for. Look at, you know, look at what he's done, the Massachusetts miracle. You know, look at all that, and it just kind of all fell by the wayside because of one picture. You know, it was kind of, I, mean, it makes, I found it weird. Yeah, no, I still find it weird. What about Willie Horton? That, that, played a, that played a big role in it, too, which I thought was unfair. Although I did stories on it, but I, I thought it was very Willie Horton thing. If you all know what Willie Horton thing was, he was released as part of a program for pre-release for prisoners, and he committed another crime, which not the first time it's happened in this country, and it's happening now in the state. Uh, SJC made a ruling a while back that's happening a lot. But, and that, that was a big deal, too, Willie Horton. Uh, he went out and committed a horrible crime, murdered again. And uh, yeah, the Republicans played that up. It, it does make me think though, um, you know, especially having, you know, had a presidential election a couple of years ago, just how times are, di yeah, right. <laughs> how times are different now, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> would that photo have made an impact, that kind of an impact today? Um, and, and I guess when you look back that at That photo today would be so, Vanilla. Be forgotten, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> but in general, when you look back at the 80s, when you look back at the news that you covered and the world that you covered, uh, how does it compare to what, you, I mean, you're still a reporter today. Well, how does it compare to what you're working on now? And what you see in the world around you? Are you recording? <laughs> uh, it doesn't compare. Uh, not to say that we don't do good news. We still do good news in this city, this city. Uh, but local TV news has been constrained by economics, yeah. and our staff cutbacks have been dramatic, just like, you know, I, I still wake up every day hoping the globe's still in my driveway because they, they have suffered horrible cutbacks, and so have we. Uh, and it's, you know, it's obvious is what the reason is, and... And I don't begrudge the internet anything. I get half my information from Googling on my phone or Siri, you know. So the local news is not what it used to be, but not that you shouldn't expect to still get good quality information on your local news. You should, and I think we still provide it, just not 100% of the time, Henry. <laughs> Maybe GBH. We try. <laughs> That's right, that's right. Henry Santoro, our midday news host, is right here. Um, but I mean, I guess I'm, I'm also wondering about the, the world that you were covering, right? And when you look back at the 80s, do you look back at it and, and what you covered then? Do you look back at it with nostalgia? Uh, do you feel like things are better now, worse now? In terms of what, how we cover the news? No, I just think, I think in terms of the, the world itself, the right? Wor I mean, the like world you, itself you a is a lot weirder now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Back back then, uh, there were weird things going on, but they generally were stay, stayed quiet. Uh, they were <laughs> they weren't tweeted out every day. Yeah. But uh, it was it. I look back at it with, with with pride because I think we put some of the best news programs on TV, especially locally, than anyone had ever seen. And not just WBZ. I mean, all of us were doing it. Yeah. You know, Channel Five was great. Um, uh, and nowadays, it's just changed a little bit. I, I think there's more emphasis on things that I think are, in my mind, a little more shallow. Uh, I, I think there, these are things we need to know, but 10 seconds is fine. Now move on. Can Show me something that's got some meat to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's just the way it is. But You, you, know. you talked a little bit about... Um, some of the uh, the challenging stories, the big the big stories that you covered over the 80s. What was the most fun story you covered <laughs> in the 1980s? What was the most fun assignment you ever got? I got paid <laughs> with a camera crew to go to Key West to dive with Mel Fisher's crew for underwater treasure. Oh, man. It, it was horrible. Tough. <laughs> well, we were out in the Marquesas Keys and we rented a $500 a day underwater camera that was neutral buoyancy. And we chased around these guys, and they found the treasure from the Santa Maria Atocha. 
They, they wow. found the, the anchor while we were there. And you were underwater. We, we were you underwater. Were yeah. She, well, we were only like, it was only like 15 feet of water. My job was really to watch for barracudas while, the, <laughs> no, really, <laughs> while the camera crew that, yeah, I know. The minute you yeah, turn. you bring anything home? Uh, yeah. Yeah. A, a communicable disease. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> we'll leave that there. No, they, uh, I, I promised Abby, I'm sorry I'd keep it, you know. That, that was for Henry Santoro. Um, what was I? Oh. But you were just telling me about diving, Oh, no, man. no. The minute they turned on the lights on the camera, they turned the lights on, it would attract the barracudas. So my camera crew's down there swimming around shooting video, and my job is to swim kind of above them by about 10 feet and chase the barracudas. <laughs> Which is what I did. See, when they tell you what's in the job description for being a reporter, <laughs> scaring off the barracudas is generally not on the list. But, but, I, but that's the fun of being a reporter, right? That was a blast. Yeah. At the end of the day, we'd go back to this resort where we were staying, and the three of us would sit there and go, we're on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> this is unbelievable. And, and we actually produced a really neat five-part series. It was really neat. It got huge ratings, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, we were getting paid, and that was one of the perks. And then there's a, you know, chasing Dukakis around in 88, where you wake up in some nondescript motel in Iowa, and you go, what's that smell? <laughs> and you go, oh, the stockyard's right there. That's what it is. <laughs> well, know? Bill Shields, thank you so much for 39 years of great uh, reporting. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. here's wishing you... <laughs> Here's wishing you more fun treasure hunts like that. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Bill Shields, everybody. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Bill. We have one more fantastic speaker for you this evening. Uh, and this is going to be a fun one. We have Julie Kramer with us. I think a lot of you probably know Julie already, from hearing her on the radio. Julie, come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, Julie Kramer, legendary Boston DJ. Julie, you, yeah, I think so. How sturdy does that look? Not that sturdy. You know what, I got, I got a Capri Sun here. They got Capri Sun over there. This is 80s theme night. It's pretty much all I survived And on. who knew fruit, fruit roll-ups? Actually, my mom wouldn't let me have Capri Sun. It's mostly sugar, I think. But, but my friend's house is, it's all I do. Uh, so, Julie, I, haven't, I didn't really get to introduce her was on WFNX and other stations. Yes. Forever. Forever. I We're started when I was nine. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you had some fun times on the radio. Those that I can remember, Those yes. Can remember. A lot of fun times. We're going to show some of my photographs that, so uh, back there as well. I should point out that in addition to being uh, a DJ, a music director, and all the things that she was on the radio, she's also a pretty spectacular photographer. And you can see of some pretty cool bands as well. Um, yeah, they're gonna, they'll, they'll be scrolling. Scrolling through. Yeah, so so. You, you can narrate as, as we go along if you like. B-52s. Um, so, but, so, again, we're talking, you've been doing this for a long time, but we're talking about the 80s tonight. Chili Peppers, Capital Diner. Nice. Woohoo! Chad got the scallops. They actually look good. So, but that wasn't the 80s, though, was it? That was, was a little past the 80s. Little past, yeah, it feels the first nice Chili Peppers show I did see at the in the 80s was at the Channel. For those people who remember the Channel, um, was the band. "Sock on Your Cock" tour. Oh, by the way, they did preface preface this by saying that I could say anything and we could talk sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So. I've been cleared. They're going to edit everything. It wouldn't everything. be any fun if yeah. we were... End stories of Henry. There you go. So, all right, but, but when the 80s started, you were not on FNX, though, but you were on the radio, right? Yeah, I started uh, in college radio. Then I went to 94HJY in Providence. I was rocking southern New England. Then I went to GIR and rocking northern New England. And then I went to FNX and got my indie on. Yeah, yeah. All right. And I was at uh, FNX for 25 years. So I guess across those jobs and across the 80s, how did your time on the air and with the, the, the bands change? Well, I think in the beginning of the 80s, it was total debauchery. 
uh, for those of us who sort of lived in the scene. Was that it, a hangover from the 70s thing? Was the 70s more? Well, fun? not for me, because I was young. Right. But so you maybe for some people. For Henry, it was. Yeah. <laughs> for me, because uh, he's a little older. Um, for me, I was in college in the early 80s, and I remember when someone got a television and we would watch MTV. And like, that was such a big deal. Oh my God, all these bands on MTV. Um, and we were always in the clubs. And back then, for those people who remember, we had Bun Ratties and The Channel and Neko Place and The Rat and Spit and Metro and Venus de Milo and all these amazing clubs. And they were bands every single night. Uh, thanks to V66 in the mid 80s, tons of local bands got recognition. I mean, does anyone remember the band Tribe? Yeah. So Not Tribe would do, think about it, two sold out nights at Avalon. How many bands can do that now? Yeah, I mean, these bands, O Positive and The Nervous Eaters and Human Sexual Response, I mean, these are bands that sold out these clubs night after night after night. And, I mean, it's, which is an entirely different world than we live in now. And that's where the debauchery comes in. Because you are out every single night. And for those of you who did go to Spit, did we have anyone here who went to Spit? So, and I don't know how many people, oh, she went to Spit? You, you still have your Spit card? Damn. All right, well, do you remember when Henry was a bartender at Spit? Now, Henry, if you would go up to the bar, you'd have to get to him, he was very crowded, but if you gave Henry a kiss, he gave you a, a free drink. He was so popular. So I feel like many free I should drinks. Explain for anybody who does not know it that this guy here, Henry Santoro, is our midday news anchor here on WGBH, and and a fantastic one at that, and is a former WFNX guy who lived the debauchery with Julie all those years. I've known Henry for I think we figured out. We'll say 30 plus years so we don't completely date ourselves, but a very 35. I think we even said 37. Isn't that gross? Um, but yeah, gross. I've known Henry for a very long time. So I can, anyone who wants to know anything about Henry, I've got it. <laughs> he might not let me tell you, but I will. So uh, I guess, let me, let's, let's just say of the 1980s. Okay. Pick one year of the 1980s that was your favorite year and tell us why. Oh, I can't remember years. Oh, God, I, I, I can barely remember yeah, yeah, yeah. yesterday. I, I can't really figure out years. Maybe 85? Maybe 87? Somewhere in the middle. 86, I think, is when I showed up. All right, so I'm going to say 86 when I showed up at um, WFNX after leaving Rock Radio. Um, you know, the culture of uh, WFNX and living this lifestyle of going out all the time, partying, smoking a lot of weed on the top of the building of the uh, Lynn area where we were, um, bringing a lot of bands out on that roof. Um, it was a crazy, crazy time for a bunch of kids who are like in their early, mid-20s that Went to show after show. Yeah, Iggy. That's in the it's, uh, Kurtz Carmagia. Wait, you took that? Yeah, I did. Are you on the hood? Yes. So, so basically, Iggy Pop. We'll talk a little bit about music, a little about those photos. So, uh, Kurt had his Carmagia convertible, and Iggy was like, oh, cool car. So, he sat in it, and Kurt's like, yeah, before I knew it, Julie was on the hood taking pictures. So, what we did is we had a lot of bands coming to FNX. So, like, before, like, the Chili Peppers would pay, play the channel, or uh, that's Joe Strummer. So, um, bands would always come to WFNX to interview, and I would always take them out and about to different parts of Lynn or wherever and take pictures of them. Uh, Joe Strummer, when he walked in, he brought his guitar and then put it in the trash, like, like came in and like, it didn't have a plug or anything. Bob Geldof, now Sir Bob Geldof. Um, that was, I think, the fifth year anniversary of Live Aid, maybe? So, so um, for you, did the photography just kind of grow naturally out of the fact that you were hanging out with these great people and you had a camera? Um, I went to college for photography. That's actually what my degree is in. It wasn't radio. Radio I was just doing to, I don't know, f around and have some fun. And, um, you know, I just kept getting jobs, so I took them. You know, it was better than waitressing, which I also did. 
Johnny Rotten nice. threw up. Let me tell you this story. He walked in the door. We opened the door, and he was like, and he ran to the bathroom. He had bad clam chowder and just puked everywhere. Henry, I should have brought the picture of Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons passed a kidney stone in the WFNX bathroom, and Henry went to find it and take it. He was going to put it up on eBay. <laughs> we didn't even have eBay then, but yeah, he, eBay he was, didn't even you know, exist then, right? No. He'd have um, to go out in the street and hock it to the first person who came by. Yeah, so we had a lot of bands coming to the station that came for interviews, and, and I always had my camera because I was also a photographer. Um, I sort of was, you know, before kids could have two careers, and so I took pictures of everybody. So that's, yeah. you know, that's, okay. that's my other career that I've resurrected. So I think you, you I, I think I, I got distracted or we got distracted you were starting to tell me about why like when you arrived at FNX so when what I arrived so at FNX there was so a bunch of kids and, and it's not it was like the Phoenix was in Boston and FNX was in Lynn so they didn't really know exactly what we were doing there it was like oh those kids those funny kids and so we were playing music and making incredible production and really pushing the boundaries of what is now called alternative music and supporting all these bands now back then when the, you saw those chili peppers photos the chili peppers were playing the channel I mean, look at them now, you know? These are bands that were sort of just coming up, a lot of them. I mean, Lou Reed was Lou Reed, you know, back in the 70s. But the thing is, is we were championing all this new music, and we were out on the scene, and the scene, of course, was a lot different then with all the clubs, and we were going out with them, and we were partying with them, and we were on their buses with them, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And then when the bands came back to town, they were back at FNX. So then, you know, and, and you be, got these relationships formed with all of these artists, and we became this sort of, um, I, I want to say powerhouse, but that's not really the right word, but, you know, in the industry and in radio, the forefront of alternative music in the country. I think... And we were just a little tiny station in Lynn. Yeah. But when I think, I think now when we look back at the 80s, if you ask people, like, what was 80s music like? Well, right? 80s music was a little bit of everything because, look, if you could see, if you were watching MTV when that started, you could see Dokken. I should have given you more slides, huh? I, you could have seen Dokken next to The Cure, next to The Eurythmics, next to Motley Crue. Like, it was such a mishmash of, like, your glam and your hard rock and your punk and your hip-hop. Like... It was a little bit of everything. But I feel like for people who didn't live it like you did, if you say, what's 80s music? They'll say, Michael Jackson. Madonna. Madonna. Cyndi Lauper. But then there were the other Lionel kids. Lionel Richie. Yeah, I but mean, then but there right. were the people who would say The Cure or Midjure or, you know, any of the cool bands, Red Lori, Yellow Lori, or any of these bands that sort of were coming through, um, you know. So... I, I gotta say, I so I collect. We have, you know, I have some vinyl records at home, and I have a section that I dubbed '80s records, and then I have basically everything else. And their '80s records are like the ones that I still have from back then when I had like Cindy Lauper, she's so unusual. But like Lou Reed is is in rock, right? I mean, I, I don't I don't consider him '80s music. So I'm just wondering because we're talking about the '80s tonight. I don't think. But he was putting out music in the '80s. So of was David he would. Bowie. Like, but, but is it '80s music? Is my question. Well, I guess when you think, like, your typical 80s music, it depends, I think, what you were listening to. Like, when I think of 80s music, I think of alternative music. I think of, like, having my hair up high, using a ton of Aquanet. I mean, Kathleen probably could have told you what I was wearing back then. You know, your shoulder off and the whole bit and those O-ring bracelets. And, you know, you're kind of all kooky and weird bananarama, you know? Um, so I think it was what you were listening to. But I think, you know, David Bowie's Let's Dance, which came out in the 80s, which was huge for him, sure. you know, sure, I was listening to Bowie in the 70s, but, yeah, I was still listening to him in the 80s, too. Right. Yeah. So he was still part of my culture and my life of music. So when you look back at it, you feel like, I mean, of course, it was a fun decade for you. But was it, was it, it, was a, was it a particularly insane. good decade? When you look in, in the history of the music that you love, how was that decade? Was it a good one? 
It was a great one. It was a great one because I was in a place with a lot of people who were super creative, who had no boundaries, who had no rules, and didn't give a and went and, and pushed that envelope so far over that it became a flat piece of paper. Like, it, it, there was no holes barred. You know, although I love the 90s, too, but, you know, I liked flannel, so. But I mean, when the 90s did come around, I feel like a lot of this stuff, like Nirvana that came out, was a reaction to To, just like, how you know, dancing around to Depeche Mode. Yeah. Like, and all that. But, but now think about it, everything's secular, like what's coming around now. So I, I do think the 80s was special for me because I was in my 20s, and I had no cares in the world. My biggest care was, hey, who's driving a lands down? Or, you know, what's playing at the rat? Like, I didn't have, uh, you know, the worries that I would have as an adult today. Right. So I could just party and have fun. Is it possible to separate out the nostalgia from the, the, the judgment of the decade, right? I mean, because, like, I loved, when I was in my 20s, too, how much of it is just that you were in sort of the most pos fun possible environment and like, can you can you judge the the music separately? Well, my whole life was the music. Yeah, right. My whole life was WFNX. When WFNX ended, you couldn't pick me up off the floor. Like, I was devastated. Like, FNX was my entire life. I created my, which isn't really a good thing when you think about it, but I was so ingrained in that lifestyle and what we were doing, and I personally thought it was so important to bring new music to people. Like, that was my entire life for 25 years. So the music was everything. I do want to bring it up to the present day, though, because you are still... I'm still a DJ, a yes. A DJ. Tell us what you're up to. So I work at Indy 617. It's an alternative radio station with uh, some of the members who were at WFNX, and it's uh, internet-based. It's Indy617.com, or you can download the app. And uh, still doing the same thing, new music. Indy617. Yeah, it's I-N-D-I-E. Um, and there's an app, you can just get it. There's on an app, the and app you can store. listen to it. But it's still the same thing, you know, bringing new music to people. It, it's nothing that you would probably, a good portion of it, hear on any of the other radio stations. So it's, it's, you know, again, trying to bring new music to people and give them the experience of learning something new. But it's a different kind of music. It's more sort of, I don't know, sort of a little bit more laid back, I think. Really? Yeah, a little bit more singer songwriter, don't you think? Guys, this is a good crew. I, I've got, I, brought, I, brought, I brought a bunch yeah, of crew. True. I got a crew. M music crew um, here. Nice. I love it. Yeah, it's not really heavy. And Welcome it's, to you know, WGBH. Uh, it's fun here, too, I swear. I love it here. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> we have a great time here. And we have Henry now, so, you know, we're in pretty good shape. You know. All right, so, uh, when you, uh, this is impossible, but when you look back, like, what is, what's the most fun story from the um, 1980s? was probably hanging out with Bowie. Bowie. So I, Bowie was my um, idol growing up. Like my whole family was into Bowie. My sister used to dress up like Bowie. Um, and my mom took me to see Bowie in like 1976 at the garden. And tickets were $4.50. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. So like Bowie was everything. So I had a couple of chances to meet Bowie. But the best one that I had was that I went to um, the Four Seasons and they had like this coffee tray thing set up and, and the lady says to me, he's been good so we're gonna make him his favorite coffee. I'm like, it's friggin' David Bowie. I would give him any he's coffee he wants. He's always good. So um, he came in and um, he was with Reeves Cabral, who was his guitar player, also a local guy. And we hung out and talked, and he liked my shirt, which I should have given him, but I didn't. <laughs> and he liked my shoes, and it was really weird. And he loved my shoes. I don't think they would have fit, or I should have given them to him. But they were like these Fluvogs. And he sent his manager to Newbury Street to Fluvog to find him my shoes. And then we danced, and we had coffee, and we smoked cigarettes, and we hung out, and I taped this interview, and it was friggin' amazing. Yeah. And then I got in the car, and I totally freaked out, and my knees were knocking, and I drove the whole way back to the radio station going, I can't believe I just danced with David Bowie. <laughs> like, it was insane. And then we, it, and I taped him for like, I don't know, whatever, an hour, and we cut it down, and we ran it, you know, in different segments. Do you just, like, put that on and listen to it every night now? 
No, I th don't even know where it is. It's somewhere what? in the basement. I know. I've got oh, photos of Bowie, man. but I just, yeah, I, I, it, there's a lot of stuff in that basement. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, I'm, that we're working. That, that's incredible. why we got the new Basement Archives photos, because we unleashed those. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in that basement. But can I just point out that we've come full circle, because we started with fashion, and it was your shoes and your outfit that he was really reacting to. We've come full circle here. I want that you to know. That made the difference. I, it is killing me that I never gave him the shirt because then he could have worn it out somewhere and I'd be like, that was my shirt. My shirt. My shirt on Bowie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So wow. Bowie was Bowie was definitely, I think, the highlight of my career yeah. um, just because I loved him so much. Yeah. So I was, that was a very good lucky thing for me. I was lucky. Very lucky. All right. Well, hey, uh, Julie Kramer, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. This has been a ton of fun. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to GBH. No, I, I love it here. Here's you, Mike. Uh, uh, hey, thank you. All right, everybody. That is it for our speakers tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. This has been a blast. We're really psyched to have you all here.